Hey everyone, I'm your host, Adrian. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. All right, everybody. Thanks for hopping in. Uh, we're going to give it a minute or so just to give folks the opportunity to hop in. If they are coming a little bit late, I see the floodgates are opening a bit and keep people are coming in. So welcome, welcome. We'll get started in just about a minute or so. While we're waiting, let's play my favorite game of where's everyone joining from? Dr. Lakeisha, where are you located? I am in Maryland. Ooh, there you go. I'm located in San Francisco. Where's everyone else at? You're located where I used to, not in San Francisco, but California. So yeah, yeah. I'm a little jealous just because of your weather right now. Just it a little. It is a beautiful <laughs> 80, degree, 80 degree day in San Francisco. I can't see Carl the Fog at all through my window. Which oh, is no, really? Um, so we, we've got a good day here. And I was telling uh, Dr. Lakeisha earlier that, um, you know, the only downside to living and having this great weather in San Francisco on days like this is we don't have air conditioning. And so it can get a little stuffy in the room. Uh, Maui. Okay. Well, a little jealous of Maui, uh, Sarasota, Florida, beautiful Michigan. Amazing. I love seeing where everybody's joining us from. It makes me really happy just knowing the reach of functional medicine and, um, you know, how impactful that these types of conversations are. And I really do feel blessed, uh, working for an organization like Rupa that allows us to have these very important conversations. Um, so, Ooh, I was in Norway. There we go. Uh, we got folks from around the world, Dr. Lakeisha. Love you're, you're full I love it. it. Oh my gosh. I love it. I see somebody from Philly. So yay. He there we go. Uh, Philly, there you go. Congratulations. If you're a baseball fan of the Phillies. So with that folks, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, welcome to today's Rupa live class presented by Rupa university, the best way to learn about specialty lab work from industry experts. My name as always is Adrian Martinez, and I will be your host for today's session. Today, we have a very, very special guest in Dr. Lakeisha Webb McMillan here to talk to us about using the Dutch Test Plus to help your patients glide through the other PMS, perimenopause and menopause syndrome. Before jumping in, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Everyone joining will be muted by default, but don't fret. If you do have any questions, please use that Q&A button down in your menu bar, and we'll host a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Immediately following the Q&A, yours truly will show you exactly how to order this test right on Rupa Health. And if you have to jump early, no worries at all. We are recording this session, and you'll be able to access it on rupauniversity.com within the coming days. Additionally, we'll send out uh, a copy of the recording and the slides as well via email once we had the chance to edit it. And finally, if you are a uh, fan of this type of content, be sure to check out rupeeuniversity.com to get access to all the previous sessions that we have done. So with that, let's jump in. I'd like to introduce Dr. Lakeisha. Dr. Lakeisha Webb McMillan was born and raised in Huntsville, Alabama. She earned her undergraduate degree in biology, cum laude, from Oakwood College, now Oakwood University, and continued her studies at Loma Linda University School of Medicine. In addition to her academic degrees, Dr. Lakeisha is certified in the use of the Da Vinci robotic system for minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery. Her ability to reach and teach women has expanded through her bestseller, The Other PMS, Your Survival Guide for Perimenopause and Menopause. Her passion for helping women in perimenopause menopause and menopause included her contribution to being on the advisory board of the only FDA approved physician design vaginal lube line momentum intimacy, a gifted speaker and integrative OBGYN hormone specialist and Amazon best-selling author. Dr. Lakeisha helps women in perimenopause and menopause who are struggling with depleted hormones, get their hormones balanced, regain mental sharpness and have the energy to last the entire day. If you want to become a hormone hottie, follow Dr. Lakeisha on all social media at Dr. Lakeisha MD. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Lakeisha, I am very excited for today's conversation. I will go ahead and let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Adrian. I am super excited to be here today. Oh my goodness gracious, this is awesome. I love being able to have conversations with people that want to just expand, want to learn, want to put extra tools in their toolkit. And so today is going to be no different. And so we're going to jump right into this. So I want to know, I what if you were going to discover how to help women to glide and not slam into the other PMS? And at the same time, it would help your practice to flourish. Wouldn't that be awesome? I think that would be awesome. I would love to have learned these tools le uh, earlier in my career. 
And so today's objectives, we're going to go through some common and not so common symptoms of perimenopause, and I should even say menopause. We're going to go through using the Dutch test plus to help diagnose your patients. You're going to understand the connection between the adrenals and the sex hormones, how the Dutch test plus helps with that. And we're going to do a very brief, brief overview on BHRT or bioidentical hormone therapy. So I know that Adrian read a little snippet of who I am. Um, and so I like to be able to kind of share a little bit more if that's okay. Um, I tell people all the time, if you were to see my highlight reels, you know, those highlight reels like ESPN does or sports center, you know, they give you the highlights, right? They show you the best part of the games, right? And so if you were to see my highlight reel, you would see the following. You would see that I was blessed to be from a two parent household. Both my parents were educators. My brother and I would tease all the time and say, daddy was our biggest cheerleader and mommy was our coach because we would run in and say, hey, I want to go to the moon. And daddy would say, sure, go ahead. And mommy would pull out the pen and paper and go, okay, what's the SOP? How are you going to do this? We need to know all the steps, right? And so when I was 12 years old and I said, I want to be a doctor. I saw this wonderful video on the miracle of life, and I want to be one of those doctors that delivers babies. My parents were like, look, we're educators. We know education. We don't know medicine. Find yourself around a doctor. And so I did. I was able to follow Dr. Hicks around from the time I was 13 years old until I went to his alma mater, which was Loma Linda University. As you know, as you heard, I got accepted into Loma Linda's early selection program, matriculated there, and actually got reacquainted with a college classmate of mine. And so now we're here. 20 years later, two kids and a dog. Yes, I got a COVID dog, y'all. Um, so we're here now. And like I said, if you were to see all the little checks, it'd be like, check, 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 check. Oh my goodness gracious. Wow, wow, wow. But but can I share my real story with y'all today? If that's okay, I want to share, I want to share some of my real story with you guys. So you know there are dates in life that you'll never forget. For me, it's February the 23rd, 2010. And actually that piggybacks on another date, April 2nd, 2009. They're 10 months apart. The first date, February, is when my grandmother passed away. I remember my brother calling in the wee hours of the morning and going, oh my goodness, I don't think that she's going to make it. I don't think she's going to make it. I'm like, what are you talking about? We just talked. She just talked me home from being on call at, at the hospital. And she did not make it that night. And so as I'm standing there with my family and we're interning her body into the earth, I'm looking two plots over, seeing my father's plot who had passed away 10 months before and the grass hadn't even grown over him good yet, y'all. And now I'm being thrown into this free fall. I don't know what's happening to my body. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. Yes, there is grief. And I go into counseling and I start peeling back those layers, but there's something else that's going on with me. I don't want to have sex with my husband. And y'all, he's kind of cute, okay? I like him. He's a good guy. I'm exhausted. I wake up and I feel tired still. I'm going through the day and I feel wired, but tired. I'm gaining weight. I don't know why. I start remembering some of those conversations that my grandmother and my mother were having about my grandmother going through the change. And I'm like, is that me already? What's going on? And so I took a step back from traditional medicine. And I was able to begin to dig a little deeper into this world of integrative medicine. And I was able to do something that some people say, physician heal thyself first. And I was able to show up in a different way. And now I'm showing up as Dr. Lakeisha, an integrative gynecologist, hormone specialist, speaker, and best-selling author. As you can see, I've done several different things, but the one thing that I love being able to do now is show up for women's health and be able to give you nuggets and give you tidbits so that you can go and do the same so that we can help women in this phase of life be able to glide and not slam into perimenopause and menopause. And so who's ready to learn? I, put it in the chat if you're ready to learn today. Who's ready to learn? We're going to drop it in the chat if you're ready to learn. Drop it in the chat.
All right. So we're going to talk about common and not so common symptoms of perimenopause. We're going to talk about using the Dutch test plus to diagnose your patients. We're going to talk about understanding the connection between the adrenals and the sex hormones. And we're going to have a very brief overview on BHRT. So what are some common and not so common symptoms of perimenopause? And I should even have up here menopause. I mean, we know some of the common ones. You know, women talk about hot flashes, nice sweats, vaginal dryness. Put some of those in the chat if you've heard them or if you've experienced them, because I know that what is happening now is that some of us are now in that cohort that we're treating, right? We are the patient too, right? And so we're seeing where we're starting to not feel ourselves, right? So some of these uncommon symptoms that I like to start digging into is women showing up and saying, doctors are telling me just to eat less and exercise more. And I'm gaining weight for seemingly no reason. That's one of those uncommon or not so common symptoms that's becoming common because women are talking about it more of perimenopause. Another common symptom of perimenopause or not so common symptom that's becoming common is anxiety, okay? Or anxiety around a woman's health, feeling really anxious that something is going on, something is wrong, and I don't know what it is. Or I have something very seriously wrong. I have some, some death, you know, I have some big medical issue that nobody's going to be able to, to actually diagnose and I'm going to sit and I'm going to die. That's what people are worried about. Women are worried about that. Another uncommon or, or not so common symptom, but now is, is being common. People are talking about it more. Brain fog. Women are coming and saying to me, oh my goodness gracious, I feel like I have Alzheimer's. Something is wrong. And if we thought, start thinking about these different common or not so common symptoms, or we never thought that they were common symptoms, it's all the things that people are being told, you're just getting old, you're just getting old. And so if we start taking a step back and start digging into some of the research, we can start seeing what can be some common symptoms perimenopause. So there's a study that shows that testosterone in women, what its clinical significance is. And what they're finding is that testosterone in women is clinically significant for what they call overall health and well-being. What does that mean? Overall health and well-being. It isn't that mood? Isn't that how you feel every day? Isn't that going into that Oh, I feel like I'm able to handle the stressors of life, or I feel like I'm able to manage or I'm motivated to do certain things. So if you start looking into what testosterone can actually be in charge of, testosterone can be in charge of your mood, your motivation, your ability to focus. And so as we start digging into this, some of these what we thought were not so common symptoms are now being common and we can start identifying them and saying, hey, when your patient comes in and saying that, saying, you know what, let's dig into this a little deeper. Let's see what's going on with those hormones. And that's where this, this Dutch test is going to come in. We're going to talk about, so let's look at some other things that are coming out. There's other studies that are coming about out about the symptoms during the perimenopause, prevalence, severity, trajectory, and significance in women's lives. This is impacting women's lives and their ability to show up, their ability to perform, their ability to contribute to society in a, in a, in a way that is able to continue to be significant. You have women that are part of the C-suite. You have women that are in, in significant positions. And if they are not able to function, if their symptoms get so severe that they cannot function, it affects the institution that they work for. You have people that have institutional wisdom. And if they are not able to still contribute, the institution begins to fail. So as we start seeing how big the 
ripple effect that this has, we can really start digging in and being able to give back and be able to help women be able to give back more. There's other things that are coming out saying what every gynecologist should know about perimenopause, the symptoms they are talking, you know, again, it's not just vaginal dryness. It's not just night sweats. It's not just, it's not just hot flashes for women. It's more than this. A lot of times women come to me and they talk about this crippling fatigue. It is a fatigue that they have never felt before. It's a fatigue that they, they do very little. And it seems like it is just so hard to do life anymore. I have one woman that said to me, she was like, it shouldn't be this hard to just live every day. And so that is what you're going to start hearing, the vernacular that you may start hearing. Women start not being able to focus, not being able to do what they used to do on their jobs. Some women that used to be able to read complex reports, be able to break it down, take charge of that C-suite meeting. Now they're fumbling for their words. They can't be able to remember what they were supposed to talk to you about. These are things that are showing up and this is how it's showing up. And it's actually now becoming a common symptom of perimenopause. Headaches. There are some women that start complaining about headaches that never had headaches before. And you start digging in and you're like, okay, what is the, what's going on? Why are you having headaches? Are, you know, is it cluster headaches? Is it stress headaches? And, and you don't start realizing that it's actually because these, these hormones are not doing what they used to do. So here are some of the contributing, what is contributing to these symptoms, right? And it's because the hormones are not going at the level that they used to anymore. So there, there's a book I love to refer to. It's called The Secret Female Hormone. And Dr. Kathy Maupin is the author of that book or one of the contributing authors. And she talks about testosterone deficiency syndrome. And I love that she actually gave it a name. And she talks about how in as early as our late 30s, testosterone can start dipping, progesterone can start lowering, not going as high as it used to go. And so how does this show up every day? It shows up in those symptoms that we were talking about. Symptoms that don't seem as common, but they're really common symptoms of perimenopause. These are the things, this is how it shows up. Women start talking about how they just can't focus. Women start talking about how they're not seeing the results when they go to exercise anymore. Women start saying that they can't get that restorative sleep. They feel wired, but tired. These are the reasons why is because as we see in this graph over here, a lot of the hormones that helped us have a regular cycle are starting to do things that they've never done before. So as you see here, this is the regular cycle. A lot of us know, and, and the way that I actually talk about this to my patients, I say it very simply like this. I say, hey, estrogen is the hormone that makes the grass grow tall. Progesterone is in charge of the lawnmower system, so to speak, okay? Progesterone also has another job to make sure that the grass doesn't grow, but so high, okay? And so as you go through this cycle, estrogen starting to rise, you have progesterone, the green line here, you have mid-cycle happen, and there's an egg that was fertilized, okay? Or not fertilized. Progesterone waits around for the memo. It says, hey, was there an egg fertilized? No egg was fertilized. Okay, guys, in two weeks, we're gonna mow the lawn. Okay, so progesterone should hang around for the rest of those two weeks. You see how it should still creep up, creep up, creep up as estrogen goes down a little bit. Progesterone should stay high enough that women don't get those PMS symptoms like the, the sore and tender breast, the inability to get to sleep like the week before your cycle, um, being feeling bloated, not feeling um, like they can fit into their clothes anymore, right? And so this is what should normally happen. Progesterone should hang around and then at a certain time it should say, okay, I'm going to start dropping. I'm going to let out the lawnmower system. I'm going to let the uterine lining shed. And that is the normal 
cycle as we see here. Well, what's going on over here? Hormones leading up to during and after menopause. You have estrogen here in the pink line here. You got estrogen that's kind of going up, down, up, down, kind of leveling out. You have FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, which is the hormone that goes and shouts down to the ovaries that says, hey, it's time to make an egg. It's time for you to make that estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. It's kind of going all over the place too. And what happens, and I tell women this, is that when the ovaries stop listening to that brain signal, that FSH, that FSH starts getting higher and higher. I say, think of it as a volume knob. It starts cranking up. So that's why FSH starts going up, 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 up. Okay. And so if you were to do a serum test, and we, we're talking about stretch test the, today, you would see in serum, you would see the FSH to go up and nice and high, but we're going to talk about how this is going to be very helpful with the Dutch test too. Now, progesterone is also going to start dipping. You see how it starts dipping around age 35, 45, 50, and it goes down, down, down. Now, progesterone is also the hormone that I says, it kind of goes to the adrenals and it goes, Shh, everybody's good. Everything is okay stop and let her ears come let her shoulders come down from around her ears okay so you know women are always like this or people that are anxious are kind of like this progesterone goes everything's good it's cool we're okay so the this is what starts contributing to this cluster of symptoms or some of those symptoms that we don't necessarily attribute to perimenopause but we are finding in perimenopause other symptoms that i'm starting to hear vertigo ringing in the ears or tinnitus um i even have and this is my personal one i can share with you burning of the mouth. I have this burning of the mouth that can happen when those hormones kind of do a dip, a loop-de-loop. -loop. So let's talk about using the Dutch test, Dutch test plus to help diagnose your patient or really kind of help them to understand that they're not crazy. Like there's true physiology that is happening. All right. So let's, let's talk about this woman. She's 48 years old, G2P1A1. She has a history. She's complaining of brain fog, anxiety around ongoing job responsibilities. She has digestive issues, no hot flashes, mild night sweats. Or she said more so of like a warmth. And that's what some women will talk about. Oh, it's more of like this warm feeling that they get at night. It's just uncomfortable on and off, but a very mild, a lot of fatigue exercises two times a week and recovery is really, really hard. Sleep, oftentimes she wakes up and doesn't feel rested. There are times she can wake up at that 2 a.m. time and her mind will start racing and she can't go back to sleep. Her surgical history two to three years ago, she had a stereotactic needle biopsy of the right breast for calcifications on a mammogram, but no malignancy was found. Her cycles were usually every 25 to 26 days and regular with six days of menstruation, but she had started noticing that her periods were starting to get further and further apart. They would become irregular um, as well. And so she was wondering, hey, what's going on? I can't predict this every 25 to 26 day regularity anymore. So what do we do? We did the Dutch Plus. And this is, this is what I love about the Dutch Plus. I hope that you can see this. So when you do the Dutch Plus or any Dutch test, I love that they do this hormone testing summary. So this section here will show you, um, and it's kind of almost like a speedometer type of a little wheel here where you can see this is like the key. So it'll tell you if, if your levels fall within the yellow stars, I wish I could blow this up a little bit, but within the yellow stars, this is where your levels can be if you're premenopausal. If you're postmenopausal, this purple area is where your levels really should be. Also, this is estradiol, this is progesterone, this is testosterone, and then down here are the adrenal glands. And we're going to talk about how the adrenal glands and the sex hormones play together. And if one is um, trumping the other, what you're going to see. So 
Here's another way that they give you the information. They'll give you the name of the test or the item. They'll let you know if it's within the luteal phase or if it's in the range, below the range, above the range, the test results for the patient. And then it will tell you the range here and it'll give you the postmenopausal range as well. So it will take all of the little metabolites or what they're called, and it will put them there as well so that you can actually see them. Now, this is the way I love to go and review the test with patients because this is how my brain works in terms of flow, in terms of biochemistry. And so we can actually see what's going on. This is great because over here you'll see is the progesterone box. Here is the androgen box. And here is the estrogen box. So I always start over here and I tell patients here, so there's no number in this top progesterone because this is urine, this is dried urine, you're looking at metabolites. So you don't measure progesterone directly in the urine, you measure the metabolites. And that's what the, the Dutch test does. It kind of helps you go back upstream. So it looks at the metabolites and it helps you to interpret from the metabolites that come out what's going up upstream, what's possibly going on with the receptors, is there are is what's in the serum actually getting into the cells, are the cells actually utilizing it, metabolizing it, and then what is coming out on the other end. So as you can see, she had the, this is the beta and the alpha subunit of progesterone. Her levels for the beta were within the yellow stars, but her alpha was on the lower end. Okay, so alpha subunits mainly tell you what's going on at a tissue level, and the beta subunits kind of tell you what's going on um, at the cellular level or the serum level as well. So here we're seeing that she's not getting a lot of progesterone in the tissues. So it's not being absorbed that much and it's on the lower end. So what do we know about progesterone? Progesterone, when it is on the low side, it could actually give you some symptoms of what she's complaining about at night not being able to have that temperature regulation at night, being having that warmth symptoms, having that warmth that comes over her at night, having that ping, her brain kind of pops open. And I'll show you some other things that show why the brain pops open as well. And so I'm able to show her and say, hey, look, your progesterone, your natural progesterone is on the lower end. You are not making what you probably used to make and this is why you're starting to see some of these changes. This is also a reason why your cycles are probably not as regular as they used to be because progesterone, now when you look over here in the androgens, androgens are those hormones, we mainly call those male hormones and testosterone is one of them. But most, uh, we all know men and women make androgens as well. And so here you can see testosterone. Here you can see the other two main androgens here. You'll see DHEA and you'll also see the 5-alpha reductase activity. So this fan here, as you'll see as we go down, fans indicate enzymatic activity or even metabolites. Um, so when we look here, I can tell her, your testosterone, your natural testosterone is way down below the average where you should be. Testosterone also, when at nighttime, can give you low testosterone, can give you like this warmth feeling as well. Or even throughout the day, I've had some women say, hey, I'm starting to get some warm flashes throughout the day. I don't know what this is. And when you give them back testosterone and progesterone, they feel so much better. Now, we know that a little bit of testosterone aromatizes or turns into estrogen. And so we're going to have to follow this dotted line over here. So we know testosterone's low testosterone contributes to the ability to exercise and make lean muscle and recover very quickly. What did she say was happening to her? I'm exercising. The recovery is taking longer. I'm not seeing the benefits of it. And so then the other thing we start looking at as well is that I want to make sure that her enzymatic activity is not running too high, because if this 5-alpha reductase activity is too high, then you can actually see some of the side effects of having elevated or more androgenic type of hormones on board of the androgens. So these can be, the, the symptoms can be like hair thinning, especially around the temporal region. 
Um, they can start talking about um, not being able to really the, the hair is, is the biggest one or starting to have acne again. So they'll say, I started breaking out again. I don't understand what's going on. I, you know, this is like something that has either they've never had acne or they start breaking out again. Now we have the estrogen side of things over here. So here we have the different types of estrogen. You have E1, E2, and E3, okay? And this is the way that you actually, the body metabolizes them, though the body actually helps them to get detoxified and, and, and flushed out of the system. I, I love an analogy that Dr. Carrie Jones uses, and she's given me permission to use it in my other talks. So I'm going to take license here too, but she uses a, a bathtub analogy. Okay. And it is a wonderful analogy where she says, when you're talking about, especially estrogen detoxification or the way that estrogen gets cleared out of the system, you have to make sure that you're putting the right water. So water going into a bathtub and then draining out of the bathtub is the analogy she gives. And so estrogens, you have to have the right form of estrogen. So here is where we're looking to see, are you making the right form of estrogen? As you can see, this patient is making a lot of something called 16-OHE1. And 16-OHE1 actually is more estrogenic. So it kind of actually upregulates the estrogen receptors a little bit more. So you can actually have more symptoms of estrogen dominance because she's making a whole lot more of this e, this 16 hydroxy E1. And then she doesn't have enough of this progesterone to balance that off. Now, the other big thing we like to look at is this 4-OHE1. The 4-OHE1, this one, if it's really high, this is the one that if it does not get cleared from the, from the system, it can induce some DNA damage. And so we want to make sure that we, we detoxify the 4-OHE1 and get it out of the system. The 2-OHE1 is, your, is what you really want to drive the, the estrogens to because it's easy to flush out. Your, your liver can can actually detoxify it very easily. You can methylate it through the comp enzyme and get it flushed out of your system. Here's another fan here. This is looking at methylation activity. I love that they have this on the Dutch test because methylation is really important in the detoxifying process. If you have patients that have low methylation activity, then you want to make sure you're giving them methyl groups so that they can clear this out of their system, okay? Because again, estrogen hanging around will give you some, some unwanted symptoms. So here we go with the bathtub analogy. The water going into the bathtub, the bathtub having the water there and then draining it out of the bathtub. So the drains are your is, is your sewage system. System. That's your poop and your pee. You got to make sure that that's open and flowing. If you are not able to detoxify in the liver the way that you should, the water kind of sits there and gets gunky and gets reabsorbed. And that's what can wreak havoc in the system. So again, right types of hormones into the bathtub. You want to make sure that you're supporting liver detoxification. And then you want to make sure that you can actually drain the bathtub. Dr. Carrie Jones always talks about this is the way that it flows, but you address it with your patients backwards. So when my perimenopausal women come in, I'm always asking about their digestive system. I'm asking how much water they're drinking. How, you know, are you going to the bathroom regularly? Because when you go to start helping to balance these hormones, if the piping system is not open, you're not, they're, they're not going to like you very much. They're going to have some issues and, and that's going to be a whole nother discussion. So here's the first step. As we can see, this is starting to tell this woman the story of her so that she gets some foundation, she gets some concrete data that she's not crazy. There is physiology behind what's going on in her body. Here is the next step of the Dutch plus. So the Dutch plus also looks at the cortisol pathway, your adrenals. It does a saliva component. So you have the urine component and you have the, the saliva component. 
It also has your cortisol awakening response, which is huge, especially in this time of life. So remember one of those uncommon symptoms or not so common symptoms that I say is now common, which is the anxiety, the uh, that, oh my goodness, the worriness. It's almost like um, ruminating almost where it's like, oh my goodness, something's wrong. Something's wrong with me. So now we can start looking at the adrenals because remember, there is a whole HPA axis that we need to talk about and discuss as well. So we have the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal gonad thyroid axis. Okay, you have that HPA GTA axis. And we want to see how this starts playing into the hormones as well. So here's that say, I, again, I love graphs. I love this, love this. So in that Dutch plus test, th this is one of the pages that you will see. It actually talks about the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and then the adrenals. It gives you a melatonin wakening, a number here. You get your total DHEA production. You're going to get your metabolites for the cortisol. And then you're going to also get, um, you're going to get this fan to see if you're making more cortisone or more cortisol metabolites. Metabolites. Down here are your graphs that tell you about the cortisol awakening response. Now, overnight, what should happen with your patients, with a woman's brain and, and how everything starts working together? Overnight, progesterone should start that process. Progesterone should come in and say, it's time to go to sleep. So let's click this off. So progesterone actually starts helping you to wind down and land the plane. Estrogen and testosterone kind of help and take over and give you that restorative sleep, along with serotonin, making melatonin, breaking down even further, making cortisol overnight. And then you also have that dopamine pathway that also helps to make norepinephrine and epinephrine. And all this together gives you a fuel to start your day. And that's when you can make your cortisol overnight so that you can wake up, be refreshed, ready to start the day, okay? What can happen with most women is that as these hormones, remember that graph where those hormone levels were not going as high as they used to, how does this look? How does it show up for them? It shows up as interrupted sleep, either inability to get to sleep or inability to stay to sleep or both. That remember, I said that bing, their brain opens up and wakes up mid morning. I have it never fails. Women tell me all the time, my patients tell me between two and four. That's my have a little talk with Jesus time. <laughs> you know, so, so if my, you know, my grandmother used to talk about it and it was like, you know, it was that ping. Am I supposed to be awake? Is something going on? Am I supposed to be, you know, doing something? And so this is where this can, the interaction between sex hormones and neurotransmitters comes into play. The other thing that can happen is when there is a stress signal. So you see up here, stress. We do not give stress the credit that it deserves in our lives. When there is a stress signal, the body goes, okay, our main job is to help this person survive. That's our main job today. Our main job is to make sure that they can make decisions, that they stay sharp, that their eyes are able to track things, that you know they're able to get to and from their destinations. And this is what we're supposed to do today. That's where the sympathetic nervous system gets heightened, okay? And the parasympathetic system goes down. When the body has this stress signal, it says to the reproductive side, shh, why have sex, have fun, reproduce? No, 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 we're not doing that today. So when there is a stressor, and so it's almost like this perpetual wheel that women get on that now their hormones are low. They feel a certain way. Now they are not able to perform the way that they used to. Now they have more added stress. And so now this stress is now showing up in the adrenals. And so what this is, the beauty of the Dutch test, the beauty of the Dutch test plus and the car, which is your, your, your cortisol awakening response, 
tells us how equipped for stress you are. Okay, so here we go. So as you can see, there are these different points. This is the cortisol pattern. This is the, so this is the free cortisone. So this is free cortisol. This is free cortisone. Now, cortisone is the cousin to cortisol. Cortisone, I call it the cousin. It is the deactivated form of cortisol. It's where your body comes in and says, oh, don't need that much cortisol. Deactivate it, make it cortisone. Cortisone is not easily flushed out of your system, out of your kidneys per se. So you don't get rid of it as easily as you do cortisol. Cortisone is like going to the gas station and putting 87 octane fuel in when you actually need 93. Okay. So how does that look? Well, for one, you have more cortisone metabolites. And as you can look here over on this side, more cortisone metabolites. So you have more of this inactivated form than you have cortisol. In the morning, there is a response. So this is the first, this is the awakening response. And then 30 minutes later, you should see how much cortisol is still on board or how much you've actually produced. And that then tells you your ability. It's almost like the elasticity in your rubber band, your ability to handle stress. So she does have a pretty decent cortisol awakening response, but look, it's more cortisone than cortisol. What did we say she was saying? There were days where she would wake up and not feel well rested, not feel as if she had totally gone to sleep. And they were not necessarily the same days that she woke up at 2 a.m. in the morning. I hear all the time women feeling wired but tired or women feeling like they never got to sleep. I haven't slept in days because they are actually have a stress response. Their sex hormones are not going up as high as they used to. So there's no interplay between the sex hormones and the neurotransmitters that used to happen. And now you have the adrenals that are now not doing what they used to do, which is make a good amount of cortisol. Okay. Now here is the organic acids test of the Dutch plus. And this is great because what this does is it takes these micronutrients and some cofactors that are very necessary in terms of what is needed to make sure these hormone levels or hormones are metabolized properly. I should say it that way. And so you can start seeing, are there some, are there some supporting actors? Are there supporting things that actually need to be addressed? So when you look at the organic acids, they are the inverse. So if you see it saying deficient or high, it may mean that this, it, so I'm sorry, when it says that it's high, it may be deficient. So it's the inverse. So as you can see here, this is B6 marker. So this is a metabolite of B6, one of the metabolites of B6, it's above range. So B6 is one of these markers that are utilized and needed for the ability for your neurotransmitters to actually break down overnight so you can make that cortisol the next morning. So you see how this is interplaying? When you look at dopamine, neurotransmitter metabolites, these are directly proportional. So if it's low, it's low. So as you can see here, some of the metabolites for dopamine and norepinephrine and epinephrine, they're on the low side as well. These two, interestingly enough, they also need some of the B vitamins. They also need methyl donors as well. She had great methylation activity, but she had low B6. So we need to rectify that. Her melatonin was on the low range as well. And so we need to rectify that. And then her exit, ox, sorry, oxidative stress. So oxidative stress was within range. That is good. So that is saying that she does still have the ability to repair her cells once they are, once they have encountered a free radical and they actually have some breakdown. So how to use the Dutch test plus to diagnose your page. Sorry, here we go. So this was the, uh, a plan. 
So she had low progesterone, low testosterone, more cortisone metabolites, low B6 activity, low neurotransmitter activity, and elevated 5-alpha reductase activity. So what the plan was is to actually help with the low, with the 5-alpha reductase activity was use testo quench, which is stinging nettle and saw palmetto to actually turn down a little bit of that activity. So she wouldn't have so much of the other androgenic hormones that were, were you know, that were there on, on a higher, um, that were showing up more than the testosterone. Also to start her on some progesterone, ashwagandha could be very helpful for the adrenals to help to reactivate that cortisol. And then maca root is very good for helping with ovarian function, making sure that she could start making more of the testosterone all on her own and being able to even help with, um, even help with sugar, with making sure that the blood sugar levels were balanced in the, in the bloodstream as well. So we understood, so understanding the connection between the adrenals and the sex hormones, we kind of went over that a little bit because again, if we do not take care of that stress, when we give back those wonderful things that we just talked about, when we give back the progesterone, when we help make more testosterone, a lot of times the adrenals will use that as fuel sources to be able to fuel the stress pathway. And then that person will not feel the benefits of what we've done to help to increase the sex hormones. So that's where the connection comes in. It comes in and making sure that you address their stress, make sure that you address, you know, what is going on in terms of, hey, do you need to add more people on your team like a coach? Do you need to start doing other things like meditation and deep breathing? Do you need to make sure that, you know, that that you're actually doing restorative types of exercise instead of the, the exercise that's really hard on the body and helping women to understand that because I had to do that myself, making sure that I actually had to stop doing the exercise I used to do in college and making sure that I was doing something that was restoring and supporting the parasympathetic nervous system and not supporting the sympathetic nervous system, putting me into overdrive as I got back my hormones balanced. So let's go over a brief overview of what are some options out there in terms of bioidentical hormones. So we talked briefly in that in the patient vignette about utilizing some of the supplements like ashwagandha, maca root. Uh, there are those substances out there that can be utilized in terms of helping to support ovarian function, helping to support um, regulating blood sugar levels. And now there are, we can also talk about bioidentical hormones and they come in various different forms. So some, some people will know about pellets, there is um, creams, and for men, there are injections and for women too, you can actually even do injections. They're made by compound, by compounding pharmacies. They mainly come from plant-based type of an origin source. And so this is where they are different from what was actually studied in that WHI study, which was the 2002 study that, or it came out in 2002, where they had to actually stop one of the arms of that initiative a little early because they found that there were some, um, there were some uh, endpoints that they did not, that were coming up that were, that were unwanted. So when it comes to bioidentical hormone therapy, I, I listen to the patient. I know their background, I've taken a thorough history, and then I have a discussion with them to say, if they are a candidate, we've gone over the Dutch test, the Dutch test plus, and now we can start having a discussion and come to an agreement together. I always tell my patients, you're in the driver's seat, I'm in the passenger seat, and you're telling me where you want to go. And I'm going to tell you which GPS coordinates to put in so that we can get there together. Okay. So what we do is I will say, here's how you can do your, your horm This is how you can replace hormones. You can do pellets, which are just placed right under the skin, or you can do a cream where you actually have to apply it daily. And this is, and the way that we talk about the differences is we talk about the bioavailability. And we talk about the options that are there other than just birth control options, because a lot of my patients come and they're telling me that they're told that all they can do for their periods that are irregular, 
the hormones, the moodiness that they feel is that they've been given, they've actually just been given a birth control pill. And so I say, no, let's talk about what's out there. And we start talking about the differences. Pellet therapy, and you'll see some of these graphs if you go on, um, on, on online yourself. So pellets, the, actually the levels, the bioavailability or plasma availability goes up slowly over time and levels out and stays pretty much the same over about four months. Now your body can, as you are active, it sends blood flow to that area and it kind of like, you know, opens up or actually blossoms that pellet over time so that your body gets what it needs. Injections, you inject sometimes twice a week. There are some people that are doing micro injecting. So they're actually injecting very small amounts every day so that they can try and mimic what they get with pellets. But I tell patients, you mainly get a nice um, elevation and then you'll start dipping and then you have to, you know, inject again. Patches, you change them, you know, biweekly. A lot of people feel that the patches may not give you as much of the bioavailability, but I have seen it where I've actually retested and I wish I had this um, Dutch test for you, but I've actually retested a patient that was on patches and her estrogen levels, look, her metabolites looked great. And then there are the creams. And some people say the creams send you on this little roller coaster because you've got to apply it every day and you have to apply it basically the same time every day because bioavailability goes down pretty quickly. But I have patients that will do the application. They may apply it twice a day. And so they tend to get more of an even type plasma bioavailability than what you would see here. But this is what we talk about. We talk about what are their options. And then I do a lot of accounts on cancer, because that's the big thing, right? A lot of patients come in and say, I don't want to get cancer. You as a practitioner, you're like, look, I don't want my patient to get cancer. So let's briefly talk about that WHI, the Women's Health Initiative. And I break it down this way. I feel like I have a special connection to it because it came out July. The, the papers came out to my residency program director July of the year I started residency. And I remember her running in and going, oh my goodness gracious, have mercy. We've got to put, every, we got to stop everybody. This is bad, this is bad. And what we did not do as a community of educators, medical interpreters that we are, we did not sit down and say to women, hey, this is what they, what they discovered. Women that were in this study, and it was a huge multi-center study, one of the biggest ones to date, even that we know of even thus far, is that most women in this study, the average age was 63 years old. These women had known cardiovascular risk and the hormones that were used were synthetic hormones. It was a synthetic progestin and a synthetic estrogen. It was equine estrogen. So it was from a pregnant horse mare. And what we found is that when they looked at women having an increased risk and having another cardiovascular event that, that did happen, they even looked to see if women were having increased risk of breast cancer. And it appeared that women were having an increased risk of breast cancer, about eight per 10,000 women. And so they said, wait, we've got to stop this. And then as they dug into the information even more, they realized it was the progestin component of the hormones that was really giving this increased risk of breast cancer. Now, late I think just of this year, there was another addendum to this data that they found that there really was not a statistical significance. So the p-value really wasn't statistically significant of actually increasing breast cancer risk above a woman's baseline of just being a woman. And so I feel like we have to get this narr narration out there. We have to be able to help women understand, give them information so that they can make informed decisions. They can make an informed decision to have bioidenticals if that is something for them, or they can make an informed refusal. I think an informed refusal is just as important as an informed consent. How about you? And so really going in, looking at this study and making sure we understand. 
The other thing is also going in and looking at positional statements, such as the one that the North American Menopause Society came out with in 2017. Their stance is that if a woman within five years of going into menopause seeks out hormonal therapy, they believe that the benefits for decrease in colorectal cancer, decrease in breast cancer, decrease in dementia, decrease in osteoporosis is huge. And then they say, if you're on it for 10 years, you should have a discussion with your doctor at the 10 year mark. So that lowest dose for shortest amount of time is not necessarily the staunch mantra now. It is really have a conversation, start letting these women have take a hold of their health now in perimenopause so that they can glide into this area of life so that they can stop having some of these not so common symptoms and they can show up and be productive and feel like themselves again so they can remember just how beautiful and vital they are. So as a bonus to you today, I want you to learn how to biohack the system and help your patients live again. It was my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon or this morning, wherever you are joining us from. You can find me on all the social media platforms at Dr. Lakeisha MD. That's D-R-L-A-K-E-I-S-C-H-A-M-D. Thank you so much, Adrian, for having me. Absolutely, Dr. Lakeisha, that was fantastic. Uh, amazing and very important conversation to have. Um, and I know that we talked about COVID pups earlier. So this is my guy, this is Cannoli. Uh, so he's going to, say hi to everyone, but we got a ton of questions in the chat. So let's jump in and I apologize if we can't get to your questions. We got so many and I do want to be um, aware of time here. And so if you do have to jump at the top of the hour, you know, as I reiter reiterated a number of times, we always record these sessions. So you go ahead and look out for a copy of the recording along with the slides coming your way in the coming days. Um, but with that, let's jump into the Q&A. So the first question that we got was regarding the decision uh, to put a postmenopausal woman on hormone replacements, how do you decide who should be put on HRT when herbal and nutrition therapies are not enough? What criteria do you use to make the decision to prescribe HRT? That is a great question. Oh my gosh. I love this question. And so Adrian, you're going to have to be the Sandman and take me off the stage. Okay. <laughs> I got you. Because I use symptoms as my criteria. I tell a patient when we're talking, I want you to be as functional as possible. And I want us to be as safe as possible. So again, looking at your medical history, sitting down, have a conversation with them and being able to understand what's going on with them medically, know all of their medical history. And if they're a candidate for it, and like you said, Hey, we can try some other things first. Let's try the herbals. Let's try lifestyle changes. You know, let's work on the gut. That's a whole nother issue that I didn't even get to working on the gut health as well. And then we can say, okay, Let's start, let's talk about HRT. Let's talk about BHRT. Let's talk about what it is, the forms of it, what you can do, how you can actually um, implement this in your life. So this is regarding a person in the chat who may be going through some symptoms themselves. So, so hot flashes only in hot weather, but it turns into panic attacks as they can't regulate temp. Could this be a sign of hypothyroid? Ooh, that is a great question. Yes. And so this is a wonderful thing that I, I talk about too, is that when you actually dig into the Dutch test and you can really get some great information, there are ways to even look at the cortisol part of it to see if maybe the, the results are, are showing you that there may be a hypo or hyperthyroid component to it because thyroid hormone sometimes influences that cortisol is all pathway and that temperature regulation pathway. We know that thyroid does have a big component, um, plays a big role in temperature regulation. So get your thyroid tested, make sure that they test not just your TSH, but the free T4, free T3, reverse T3 even, and the antibodies, because that is really crucial to make sure of all the components of thyroid hormone. Wonderful. Uh, is this test beneficial for postmenopausal women? Yes, yes. I have, and I have uh, the the one that I think I stated 
that was on the on patches um, that I wish I had shown hers. She's postmenopausal, and that was the that was one of the great things I loved about her test was that we could see kind of before and after. And it was this, oh my goodness. Okay, so the actually what happened was I put her on creams and the creams, what we saw was that it just was not absorb, like she was not absorbing it, was mm -hmm. just not working. And we could see that on the, on, the, on the Dutch test. And then when I switched her over to a patch, you could see how it just, that it was just the way that her body absorbed it. That particular yeah. molecule, that particular form of estradiol, her body loved it, did not like the creams. Super interesting. Uh, and just a reminder, y'all, I know we're at the top of the hour. So if you have to jump, that's completely fine. Um, again, we'll send out a copy of the recording that will include the Q&A. But getting right back into it, should patients go off hormones prior to testing? The way I answer that is by saying this. If a patient is comes to you on hormones and they are not getting the benefit I say, leave them on it so that you can see what's, what's actually being metabolized. That's the same thing that was happening with, you know, once I start patients on it, I'll do a Dutch test to see if they're metabolizing it and seeing what's going on. You can use the same type of philosophy. You can say to them, Hey, if you're not feeling great and you're on hormones, we can leave you on them. And I know how to interpret the test because you're on them and we can see if you're really absorbing and you're metabolizing what you're already on properly, or do we need to adjust the dosing? When you give BHRT to a postmenopausal woman, uh, which estrogen, progesterone, testosterone reference in the Dutch plus do you target on premenopause or postmenopause level? Oh, great. I, I target on premenopausal levels because those are the levels where I've come to find anecdotally that they feel better. Because when they come to you and they're in that postmenopausal range, they usually don't feel good. And I'm not trying to send them back into reproductive phase of life. Absolutely not. I just want them to feel, I want them to feel like they are themselves again and that they have the reins back. What do you use to correct the elevation in 5-alpha reductase? That is where I use that Testo Quench. Um, I believe it's by Douglas Labs. I love Testo Quench because it has both the stinging nettle and the saw palmetto. I used to just try either saw palmetto for whatever reason, it wasn't as great in decreasing that activity. And I think the combination of both and the way that they've put that formulation together really works. I have one patient that I put her on it and she was she had stopped seeing the benefit of her pellets, the testosterone pellets, where she was um, a bodybuilder. You know, she was doing a lot of body work and she felt like her muscle mass has started dwindling. Um, she had a unique situation too, where she had had an oophorectomy for other reasons. And so she was pretty young and, and we put her on testosterone. Now, when I put her on the testo quench, but I kept her on her same dose, it decreased that activity and she was able to make more of that testosterone and stopped shunting it to like dihydrotestosterone. I think you may have covered this one, but what natural supplements do you use for low testosterone and progesterone? Oh, maca root is my go-to. I use maca. Um, progesterone, I, I love progesterone. Progesterone, I call it the kumbaya hormone. I mean, it's just... <laughs> It's just nice. So there are some um, places where you can actually get progesterone over the counter. But I say, if you're going to do that, make sure you can identify how much progesterone is per serving, because there'll be some progesterone preparations that will just say use a pump or use a pea size, or I don't know how much you're getting. And so there's, there's one out there, I can't remember the name of it right offhand, but it will say one, um, one teaspoon or one pump is equal to 20 milligrams. So I'm able to go, okay, I know how much you're getting. If you're not getting the right, you know, res resolution of your symptoms, then we need to go up to this. What day of the menstrual cycle do you perform the Dutch test? Oh, great. Okay. So what I know Dutch test has done is when you have these perimenopausal women where their cycles are very irregular, they just tell them to take the test now, because that was becoming an issue where when we were trying to wait till day 19 or 21, if you had like that 28 day cycle, but then I had women that were waiting months to do their Dutch test. And I would go, what happened? Oh, well, I haven't had my cycle yet. So 
they're just like, look, just do it. Um, if you're perimenopausal and you're kind of in that purgatory and you don't know when to do it, um, when you're going to have your, your cycle. Um, so just do it now when you have somebody coming in for other reasons, other hormonal challenges, and they have a cycle, you usually do the Dutch mapping. So that's a whole nother touch. Cycle mapping. Yeah. The cycle mapping. Yes. Yep. Perfect. And, and, and folks, just a quick note, please use the Q and a button in the menu bar. That way I can go through the questions. Those are the only ways that I'll be able to, to answer your questions is if you ask them using that Q and a button down in your menu bar, not the chat. So getting back to it, does uh, the elevation of five alpha reductase activity cause heroism? Yes, it does. It does. So you can actually, if you have a patient that comes to you that has hirsutism, you can actually put them into, put them on one of, you know, the testo quench or stinging nettle or soft palmetto, you know, use your, your, you know, your supplement of choice. And actually um, you can use that instead of trying to prescribe them, say finasteride is the other thing that you can, is a prescription though, but, um, and it's pretty harsh. So I like going the supplement route. If a postmenopause woman feels good without the typical sex hormone deficiency symptoms, but Dutch Plus shows borderline low normal estrogen and testosterone, do you still prescribe BHRT? No, I'm always asking the patient, what is their end goal? Mm-hmm. I always say to them, what is it that is your main, what are we, what are we targeting right now? And so if it is now, if they tell me another type of symptom that I know they have not connected to low hormones, then that's where the education comes in. So a lot of women don't connect testosterone with metabolism as well. And so I talk about that muffin top that we get you know, around the, the, the waistline yep. and I'll tell them, Hey, well, your testosterone is way down. I'm not telling you that we have to push you all the way up here, but getting that back up and, and getting that back on board could be very helpful. And it probably is that you've lost that anti-inflammatory property of testosterone as well. So you may have some gut inflammation. So we may have to work on both. Interesting. How do you address low methylation? Oh, so I give methyl donors and methyl donors can come in all different forms. Um, Some people use Sam E. You have to be very careful of Sam E because for some people, if they don't clear it, um, when their methyl donors stack up, they actually get anxious. Mm -hmm. Um, You can use, oh, what's another good methyl donor? I actually, it depends on where, so if you need methyl donors for neurotransmitters, like if you need it for the, the norepinephrine, epinephrine pathway, I'll actually use something called neurotransmitter balance um, that has a little bit of SAMe in it, but it's a nice little low dose. Or you could even um, use, you can even use sulfor- sulforaphane as a great methyl donor as well. And you can actually get that sometimes that may come in the form of DIM. Nice. Could you speak on the value of running the Dutch test before administering a toxic non-metal, non-metal chemical clearing protocol? Uh, and secondary, what can be planned uh, or what can be gleaned, excuse me, and provided to support the common methylation and other challenges detected by the Dutch test other than B vitamins? Wow. Okay. So the first part of that was, say that one more time. Was, was... Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's a, it a bit of a long one. Um, Could you speak to the value of running a Dutch test before administering a toxic non-metal chemical clearing protocol? No, I can't speak to that. Um, I do not do medical detoxing protocols. I send them to my super friends, the NDs. (laughs) There you go. So maybe the second part then, Uh, what can be gleaned and provided to support the common methylation and other challenges detected by the Dutch test other than B vitamins? What can be gleaned? Or what can, what can you do other than? Yeah. Okay. So Dutch will also show you glutathione. If you need more glutathione, which is a great antioxidant, that's usually up in the top part of the Dutch test. Plus when you look at the estrogen pathway and it's talking about the two OH clearing that two OH. And if that I had one patient that had a very high two OH and she, not the one that I shared with you, but the, but she had a history of having DCIS in the past. And so they, she had a lumpectomy. And when we did the Dutch test and I saw that she had that high 2OH and her glutathione levels were really low, we 
ramped that up. So you can talk about, you know, detoxification. Um, that's one of those things that, that pops up on there. There, so it'll also talk about oxidative stress. It'll talk about melatonin is on there too. I hope I'm answering the question. I think I got what you were asking. Yeah, you're covering, you're covering it, I think, right? Yeah, we actually just went to a very interesting conference this past weekend hosted by uh, A4M uh, regarding the, the stress and uh, stress and healing. And it was, it was great. Um, yes. A ton. You can talk to Dr. Carey about um, her, her favorite uh, conversation and topic, melatonin. So she's now a melatonin expert. So <laughs> what exactly, <laughs> so, so jumping into the next question, what exactly does uh, Testo Quench treat? It actually calms down that 5-alpha reductase activity. So 5-alpha reductase is an enzyme that we know if that activity level is really high, it can actually make more potent androgens. And when you have more potent androgens floating around in your system, you it can show up as, actually can show up as insulin resistance. Mm-hmm. It can show up as hirsutism. So that's the hair growth, usually around the chin area. Some For some women, they even get hair on their shoulders. If it's really elevated, you'll make more, um, you can actually, it, so it can contribute to um, obesity and weight and weight gain and things like that. So 5-alpha reductase is really important. And so making sure that that activity level is down is really important. How does thyroid hormone testing fit in with the Dutch test and in general for women at this stage? So I will do serum testing for thyroid because the Dutch test is kind of like, um, you have to kind of look for the Easter eggs, so to speak with Dutch and thyroid, it will show up mainly in the cortisol side. So that's where, if your thyroid is, is not functioning as well, then you can go in and kind of dig a little deeper into the cortisol pathway. Cause what will happen is if I, if I can speak correctly here, I hope I'm saying this correctly, the actual total metabolites won't add up. It won't mimic the actual like total cortisol metabolism, I think it is, will not reflect in that which metabolite it, you're making. I think something will, it one will be higher than the other and it won't match up properly. And that's where you can go and start digging into the thyroid. But I always have to ask about that because I do serum testing for thyroid. Perfect. So this is a cancer question. Okay. Um, so, so this is a practitioner whose uh, client got a double mastectomy and will get a total uh, salpingo oophorectomy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she will not have much hormone, natural hormone protection, which will remove the concern for those cancers. But what types of precautions should that client take who just finished chemo and is still on immunotherapy uh, for mm-hmm. high risk for breast cancer? Yeah. If they are actively in therapy, I usually say they have to be their five year mark before we can even address any type of bioidenticals. And, you know, depending on what they, you know, were they estrogen receptor positive or progesterone receptor positive, then we actually have a really big scope of a conversation um, because maybe they are not a candidate for the estrogen therapy, but they could do testosterone therapy, right. which could also, you know, make a little bit of estrogen at the level that they would need just to be able to function. And so that's one of those people that I really would have to take on a, on a client basis and say, okay, you may not be the person that I can just say, oh, you get bioidentical hormones too. You know, like you said, there, there has to be precautions, but I don't do anything while they are actively in immunosuppressive therapy, or if they're actively chemo or radio, we don't, I don't do anything. Great. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so last couple of questions here that we have time for, uh, is there, is the risk for increased thrombosis the same for all versions of HRT? Oh, no, that's a great question. No, it was with the synthetic estradiol, uh, not I shouldn't say estradiol, estrogen. And it was the equine estrogen, not estradiol. So estradiol, when it has that diol at the end, that is bioidentical. And there was no increased risk with that one. 
Okay, last question we have time for folks. And I apologize, we weren't able to get all your questions. Otherwise, we'd be here for another probably two hours. Uh, but how many months after going up birth control, would it be okay to start or test the woman for the Dutch test? And how many months after giving up DCPs, will the results truly be accurate? Oh, great. I usually say at least let her be off for a good 30, 60 days, because that whole HPA axis needs to reset. And, and you don't, and, and actually what birth control pills will increase that sex hormone binding globulin. And if you have a lot of that floating around, then it could affect, it could affect your levels of your hormones in your bloodstream. So I would say, I usually tell women, give themselves a good 30 to 60 days cycle before they do any testing. And, and that should be a good enough time. Dr. Keisha. Thank you so much. A pleasure as always. Do um, you have any final thoughts to get out to uh, the people in attendance? Oh, well, if any of you find yourselves or you're just like, hey, I, this kind of sounds like me and not just my patients, <laughs> if that's okay with you, Adrian, um, yeah. feel free to take um, my free hormone quiz. It's at hormonequiz.co. And that way you can see what's going on with you and even get yourself a free um, strategy session with me. And we could talk one-on-one. Wonderful. Dr. Lakeisha, you can find her at Dr. Lakeisha MD across all social platforms. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Um, you're welcome to hop off, but what we're going to do real quick, folks, is we're going to transition into Rupa Health, and I'm going to show you exactly how you can order the Dutch test directly from our platform today, along with thousands of other tests within the functional medicine space. So if you joined late or haven't met me before, my name is Adrian Martinez. I am the head of practitioner partnerships here at Rupa Health. And if you aren't familiar with who we are, we are a platform designed to make it easier when it comes to ordering and managing your lab tests. The way we do that is we actually partner with over 30 different labs and offer over 3000 different tests all in one place. So now instead of having to go to each individual lab to place your orders, to manage your results, you have a one-stop shop to order from all of your labs, including Dutch, Genova, Doctors Data, ZRT, and a handful of others, right? So saving you time, energy, or maybe even your admin's time and energy to be able to focus on different tasks that are the, other than the ones that are required with these lab tests. The second component to Rupa Health is we also manage the patient experience end to end. So as soon as you press send on your order, we will reach out to the patient. We can manage billing directly with them. We'll handle any patient support, any questions that they have. We'll handle any specimen issues that come up, um, as well as even helping coordinate phlebotomy. So again, these things that would ultimately take time out of you or your team's day, we'll handle those when it comes to lab tests. And finally at Rupa Health, we have Rupa University. So the educational component to Rupa Health, which you're all actually a part of right now, is another very important component to Rupa. We partner with practitioners and our lab partners to create content just like the live class that you're all currently attending to ensure that the individuals who are interested in using these tests know exactly what they're getting themselves into or if you're interested in just learning more. So let me show you just really how easy it is to place an order on Rupa. So to start an order on Rupa Health, all you need is the patient's first name, last name and email address. From there, it brings you right into your order screen and your order screen is customizable. You can do things like setting up custom bundles, which are sets of tests, sets of blood panels from a combination of any lab that we work with. That way it's just one click and those tests will be added into your cart straight away. Below that, you can create a favorites list. So individual tests that you commonly order from any lab, you can put a little heart next to it. And so if I want to order that Dutch plus that we were just talking about from Dutch, I can click that. But also if I want to order maybe a test from uh, KPMO for food sensitivities or a GI test from any one of the GIs that we offer here. Those are right at your fingertips. And if that's it, you just go ahead and click send a patient. And that's how simple it is to place an order on Rupa from over 30 different labs, over 3000 different tests. If you are looking for a specific test, you can find it down below. You can search, you can filter by biomarker, filter by lab type, even category. Once that kit is added over here on the right-hand side, you can do things like scheduling a test out in advance. So if you want to retest your patient in six months and don't want to have to go back on here and remember to do that task, we can automate that for you. Our pricing is really simple. Rupa is for you to sign up for. There's no cost to sign up. There's no subscription fee. There's no minimum spend. There's not even a contract that you're signing. The way that our pricing works is we offer wholesale practitioner prices. So the same price that you would get going directly to the labs, those are the same prices that we offer here at Rupa Health. 
The way that we generate our revenue is there's just a flat 7% processing and ordering fee on each order. And that 7% is paid for by whoever's paying for the tests. So what that means is if you're having us here at Rupa build a patient for the cost of the tests, then the patient will be the one in effect paying, in this case, $28. And that's that 7% fee. Rupa in that circumstance is free for you as a practitioner. So again, to reiterate, the 7% is the only way that we generate our revenue here at Rupa. So if you're having us build a patient, the patient will be the one paying that 7%. Rupa in that case is free for you. The alternative will be for you to pay for the tests yourself, which is definitely an option. In that case, you would just have to build a patient outside of our platform. Additionally, you even have the option to add your own fees. So if you want to add an interpretation fee, if you want to add any additional fees to the cost of the test, even if we're billing the patient, that is an option for you. From there, you can add notes for the patient. You can add notes for Rupa. You can even add ICD-10 codes to the order. So us here at Rupa, we tend to be cash pay, so we don't accept cash or excuse me, rather insurance directly. But what you can do is add these ICD codes to the order. And from there, we will actually generate an automated super bill for your patient, allowing them to submit that super bill to insurance for potential reimbursement. And if that's it, again, you just click send to patient. That's how you create an order on Rupa Health, send it to your patient, and then you're able to actually track everything right here within your main dashboard. So that uh, draft order that I just created is right here at the top, but any order that you send to a patient will be able to be tracked right here in the main dashboard. You can hop in and see in this example for John Smith, we sent four uh, four labs from four different or four tests from four different labs over to John Smith. You can see, for example, when the sample arrived at the lab, when you can expect the results to come in, and once those results are in, you just hop right back into your dashboard. You can download the results. You can send the results to your patients. We don't send the results to your patients without your consent, and you can even schedule a clinical consultation. So, if you do need some assistance or want some additional assistance interpreting these results, no problem at all. You can click that button and schedule time directly with the lab and one of their practitioners on their end, as well as you'll have access to the digital acquisition. And if you work with a handful of EHR our systems, we can even actually have these results automatically imported into that patient file. Uh, some of those EHRs that we work with are Practice Better, Optimantra, uh, Elation. We just signed with Serbo, so keep an eye out for that one, and a handful of others actually on the way. So keep an eye out for more of those exciting EHR announcements coming your way. So what I've shown you so far is how you place your orders, how you track your results. Last thing I want to show you here is really what the patient experience is, our last couple of things. So as soon as you press send on the order, we're going to reach out to your patient. We'll ship the kits directly to your patient. We'll send over instructions and FAQs, oftentimes videos on how to take the test, how to fill out the requisition form. And if there is a blood draw required, we can actually even help them coordinate that as well. We'll follow up with them. And then you are alerted as the results come in. In an ideal flow here at Rupa, you place the orders, we take care of everything on the in-between, and then you are alerted as the results come in. Seamless. This is what it looks like. So once you place that order, your patient will receive an email letting them know that the kits have been ordered by Adrian. Dr. Lakeisha has ordered these tests for you. We'll introduce who we are, and then we will actually highlight some different payment options that we accept. So this is a really cool function of Rupa Health. These kits are expensive, right? If you ever ordered them before, you know that, and actually cost can be a pretty big limiting factor when it comes to the patient experience and their ability to take these tests. And so not only can we accept credit or debit for these tests, but we can also accept HSA, we can accept FSA, and we can even set up a three-month interest-free payment plan to help the patient pay for the cost of those tests. So really cool, and that's actually how one of the ways that we're lowering the barrier of entry to get access to these tests. From there, we'll collect all the necessary information from the patient. We'll highlight any costs associated to the test so the patient knows exactly what they're getting into. If you decide to pay for the test, that's fine. Again, nothing's going to change with the patient experience, but we'll just go ahead and not show them the cost of any of the tests. Since you're managing billing directly with the patient, we're not going to show them any costs. From there, we'll send an email that looks very similar to this. Again, breaking down all the instructions and FAQs for each one of the tests that they've ordered, how to fill out the requisition form. And if there is a blood draw required, we can customize that to allow them, allow you to either tell the patient if you do blood draws yourself, hey, I do blood draws in my office Tuesdays, Thursdays from two to six, come and see me then. Otherwise, we'll send over options based on the lab that they're working with. But if the patient needs anything, whether it be support related regarding the test, whether it be, hey, I just want some additional blood draw options in my area, what do you have? They can reach out to our team and we will search by zip code to send over any available or viable phlebotomists within their area, as well as any additional costs. From there, we will send over the instructions, as I mentioned. Our instructions are very user-friendly, which I think is oftentimes something that can be overlooked, right? 
the instructions that are sent with the tests, they'll still receive those. But what we found is our test instructions are a bit more user-friendly, but just equally as comprehensive, but more simple to navigate. Once that's completed, we will follow up with the, with the patient, see if they have any questions. And then you are alerted as the results come in. And as I showed you, you just hop back right back into your dashboard and you're able to view all those results right within your main dashboard. So what we've seen so far is how to place an order on Rupa, how to track your results, and then the patient experience. The final thing that I want to show you very quickly is just the educational content that we have here at Rupa Health. So you have all been a part of the amazing conversation that we've had today with Dr. Lakeisha. We do these on a weekly basis. Um, so you can see and get access to all the previous sessions that we've done. We partner with the labs. They're not just people and they're not just vendors to us. We actually genuinely care about our labs and our partnerships with the labs, as well as the individuals, not only uh, ordering the test, but the patient side of things. And so that is the reason why we create this educational content. So you're able to have access to all the different videos that we've done in the past, sign up for ones that we have upcoming in the future. And you can see what we have coming up uh, soon as well. But these are all free. You can download the slides. You'll have access to all the recordings. And then lastly, here, y'all, we even have more than that. We even have some uh, podcasts with Dr. Carrie Jones. Shout out Carrie Jones. She is our head of medical education. We have a magazine and we even have boot camps. So if you are a practitioner who's interested in diving a little bit deeper than these 45 hour long uh, webinars, we have boot camps coming up that we partner with practitioners and labs on. So we have one upcoming soon with Dr. Jaquel Patterson on Lyme, as well as a very exciting one uh, coming up with diving deep into gut, brain, and immune dysfunction with the doctors Vojdani, as well as Dr. Jeffrey Bland. So very excited about these upcoming boot camps. Um, and then there's one down here with Dr. Carrie Jones. So with that, y'all, again, my name is Adrian Martinez. I will see if there's any questions that came in through the chat during this presentation. But if you do have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat. I'm going to hop into both of them right now. And let's see what we got. So are these tests, are there states that Rupa can't send kits to? Yes. Thank you so much for asking this. So right now, Rupa can only operate in 47 out of the 50 states. So we can operate with the, the states that we can't operate in are New York, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. Uh, if you are a practitioner that's practicing in those states, if your patient maybe has an address outside of those states, it's more so us sending the kits to the patients in those states rather than working with patients outside of those states. So if you're able to have you know, the, the, the kits forwarded to a separate address, we will be able to work with the patients. It's not necessarily the practitioners located in the states, it's the patients located in the states. Secondly, we actually just launched a program called Physician Authorization. And this is actually a program that I'm very excited about. And so what the Physician Authorization Program is, is if you're a practitioner whose certifications or licenses may have limited your ability to order tests like the Dutch tests directly in the past, we partnered with an organization that has a signing physician. And now through Rupa Health and the Physician Authorization Program, you're actually able to sign up for this program and have your requisition form signed off by a MD who is licensed in any state. And so now with that program, you'd be able to order from any lab on our platform, which is super exciting. It's opened up a lot of opportunity for practitioners who deserve to order these tests, right? Whose patients deserve to have these tests ordered for them. So we're very excited about the physician authorization program. Uh, and if you have any questions, y'all, please feel free and don't hesitate to reach out to me. My name is Adrian Martinez. So right now you do need to be in the U.S. Uh, unfortunately, we're not international quite yet. Uh, I'm excited and hopefully we'll have that in the, in the near future, but there's no time frame directly on that. So you do need to be within the U.S. or at least your patients need to be within the U.S. But again, folks, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. My name is Adrian Martinez. I hope to see you soon. I want to give another big shout out to Dr. Lakeisha. Thank you so much for that presentation today. Uh, if you have any questions, reach me at adrian at rupahealth.com. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Appreciate you spending your afternoon with me.